Hello everyone, TMA Gamer here, and today I have the pleasure of bringing you a very, very special Sunday Talk episode. Yes, I know it's a Monday, but what I decided to do was postpone Sunday Talk from yesterday so I could do a full review of the 2011-2012 Premier League season after watching the final day of football. Because, as most of you guys know, on the last day of the season, every single game is played at the same time. Three o'clock kickoff, sorry, on a Sunday. So I couldn't really do the Sunday Talk commentary at like two in the afternoon before all the final games are kicked off because there were so many things still to decide, you know, the title, three teams still going for the Champions League place, two teams battling for relegation, you know, Everton could still finish above Liverpool, all of these things that were keeping the season so interesting. So what I wanted to do was watch all of the football yesterday, you know, let it churn over my head, have a good think about it, make a few notes, make a few, you know, ideas, write them down and then now once I've had a good time to sleep on it, reflect on what I've thought, I'm going to give you in like four or five categories I think I've got here possibly a few more my review of the Premier League season so let's get straight into it now the first category I've decided to go for is the highly unoriginal manager of the year award now there are so many managers who've had a very very good season it was actually very very tough to get it down to a short list of three and that's what I've decided to do with every single award or category I've done apart from the last one but I'll get into that in a little bit more detail in a bit I've gone for the three because you know, just awarding it to one guy and just talking about him would be a bit unfair because, like I said, there's so many managers who've done well. It was only, you know, fair to make the category a bit bigger to get a few of them in. So let's get right into it. Now, the three managers I've decided to go for in the end as the shortlist for the Best Manager of the Year award are Alan Pardew, Roberto Mancini and Brendan Rodgers. Now, I'm going to talk about them all individually first. I mean, Alan Pardew, his season goes without saying. Newcastle have been absolutely fantastic this season I mean in with a shout of the Champions League right up until the last day of the season and this was a very very good shout they were so close to get in that Champions League place I mean when you look at all the money he spent as well and the team he's got together it's really fantastic I mean you play getting players like Denver Bar on a free and getting like Johan Kabay on peanuts it was absolutely fantastic to see Alan Pardew make such a talented squad for the funds he's had and the way he's motivated them and got them to work as a team and really battle has been a fantastic achievement I mean so so unlucky to get pipped by Arsenal and Spurs on the last day to the Champions League but when you look at the different finances that these teams have, I mean, you look at Spurs' team, it's got the Bales, the Van der Vaarts, Modric, Adebayor, you know, all of these players. And Arsenal, you've got your Van Persies, you know, your Wilshires, your Ramses, a lot of very, very talented players. I mean, and the vast majority of them are world class, especially players like Van Persie and Van der Vaart and Modric. So for Newcastle to stand toe to toe with those two clubs for the entire length of the season on their budget and after their expectation at the start of the year as well, I mean, I expected Newcastle to get no higher than mid table. With a really good season, I'd you know, expect them to get mid table. But the way Alan Pardew motivated players like, you know, the Ryan Taylors and the Williamsons and the Perches of that squad. You know, these are players that no Premier League squad would sit and go, yeah, I desperately want James Perch. But the way Alan Pardew has motivated that second string, it's been fantastic. And I really, really think he's had a fantastic season. So he's my first one. Roberto Mancini is my second nomination for Manager of the Year. Now... The reason why I've nominated Mancini, I know he's had a lot of things going his way, you know, the money, all of the stuff he's got. He's got a fantastic world-class team. He's been able to buy his players. He's had enough time to bed the team and now get the players he wants. But it's so much pressure fighting at the top. I mean, especially when you're up against Alex Ferguson and especially when Man City had an eight-point lead. They completely flopped it and ended up conceding an eight-point lead to United. So it's a 16-point swing. Can you imagine how negative the feeling must have been in the Man City dressing room after that? And Roberto Mancini kept his mo players motivated, picked them up off the, off the dirt, got them into a team, got them going forward. And on the final day, you know, just sums up Man City season. They looked down and out. You know, with three minutes to go, they looked like they'd thrown the title away. And Mancini's team somehow managed to battle through and get the victory. And that is something that's really, really impressed me about Man City this season. It's their man mental toughness because Man City are well known as a club that bottles it. They have known, they've been known as a bottling club for years. You know, they get close and then fail and they just have to sit in the shade watching Manchester United win every trophy in sight. But this season, they've finally booked the trend. And for a club like Man City, 
which you know doesn't have this mentality of victory like Manchester United, for, for them to win their first league title, that is such a huge mental obstacle just blasted out the way. And for Mancini to keep his side together and push them forward and get them that first league title in 44 years it really is an absolutely fantastic achievement. So that's the reason why Roberto Mancini has made my final three. Now the third guy who I've decided to go into the shortlist as manager of the year is Brendan Rodgers. Now Brendan Rodgers has brought this whole new brand of football to the Premier League. I mean he came up with a Swansea team that was widely tipped to go straight back down in fairly ignominious circumstances. You know, many people were predicting that uh, they were going to be another derby, go down with single-figure points, have 15 or 16 goals put past them every weekend, and you know, it was just going to be a bloodbath. But what Brendan Rodgers has done at Swansea just deserves so much credit because he's brought a team of players who... Most of them are lower division players, you know, they've played in the championship. You know, a couple of players like Wayne Routledge have come up and had a season here or thereabouts in the Premier League. But, you know, no really established Premier League stars. But what he's done is he's got them together playing some fantastic football. I mean, some of the best football in the Premier League is played by Swansea City. And that is something you, you probably wouldn't have ever thought you'd hear yourself say. But not only that, he's bought smartly as well. I mean, players like you know Danny Gray and Michelle Vorm, they've been revelations. I mean, Michelle Vorm especially, he was right up there in uh, my selection for player of the year. You know, I was debating putting Michelle Vorm right into my final three shortlist because he's had a magnificent season. So on the resources that Brendan Rodgers has had with the club he's at as well, which is the key thing. I mean, playing the football he does with the players he's got, at Swansea City really is fantastic and I have to say his 11 plates finished is thoroughly deserved they deserve to be there they are mid-table on merit because they have played some fantastic football and if Brendan adds a few more quality players there is no reason why Swansea can't march at the table next year so that is why Brendan makes up my last place in my three shortlist so I've decided in the end it was a very, very tight decision, you know, all of these three managers and obviously managers like Paul Lambert and lots of other managers out there who had a shot at getting into this. But I've decided to go for Roberto Mancini in the end, you know, because of the reasons I said Manchester City. Yes, it's got all of this money, but they look down and out. They look down and out so many times this season and somehow, some way, Roberto Mancini has picked them up off the dirt got them going forward and got them playing good football you know they play a completely different style of football as well they play two holding midfielders and sort of two attacking midfielders floating into the spaces you know they've brought a new style of football to the Premier League and I know they still play 4-2-3-1 uh, at times as well but it's that innovation that quality of football and finally winning Man City that Premier League which has meant that Roberto Mancini gets my manager of the year award Right, let's move on to the next category. This category is Worst Manager of the Year Award. Now, there are three nominations for this, and to be fair, these three nominations stood out fairly clearly in my eyes. The first manager is um, Kenny Dalglish. Kenny Dalglish has had an absolute nightmare at Liverpool this season. I mean, he has spent, was it 100, 130 million, 140 million on fairly average players, and all he's got to show for it is a Carling Cup. And when you are Liverpool, um, I mean, I live in Liverpool, so I know how big a, a club Liverpool is. And I know how insanely passionate the supporters are. And everything about that club is fantastic. You know, Anfield's a relatively small ground. But if it was 85,000, it would, it would be full every game. You know, the fans at Liverpool are, are really, really passionate. They're a massive club. They've got fantastic history. I mean, won the European Cup five times. That's fantastic. You know, fantastic achievement. And Kenny Dalglish... Is seen as the Messiah in Liverpool. You know what he achieved as a player, what he achieved as a manager at his first spell in the club is part of Liverpool football in folklore. So when he came back in on this crest of a wave, you know everyone expected him to do fantastically well. But the reason why I've put him in my shortlist of manager of the year is because personally he has been the most disappointing manager of the season. He has signed some pretty woeful players. They've had some absolutely atrocious results. I mean, uh, Liverpool lost at home to, to Fulham, to West Bromwich, to Wigan Athletic. They threw a two-goal lead uh, away, away to QPR. I mean, just 
awful results, absolutely awful results. You know, spent 36 million on Andy Carroll, 16 on Jordan Henderson. I mean, Jordan Henderson is right up there for worst player of the season. He is awful, especially at right mid. He's just a terrible player. You know, Stuart Downing as well, 20 million. I mean, I'm a Villa fan, and we were laughing all the way to the bank when Liverpool came in with 20 million for Stuart Downing. But, you know, even the players he didn't spend a lot of money on. I mean, Sebastian Quates, 8 million. How many times has he played? I mean, what a waste of money on Sebastian Quates. All he did was score an overhead kick. And, I mean, for a centre-half, you're not too fussed whether he scores an overhead kick or not. So, very, very disappointing Liverpool this season. Very disappointing. But that's enough on Kenny Dalglish. Second on the list is Alex McLeish. Now, Alex McLeish, as a Villa fan, has done virtually everything he possibly could to destroy my beloved football team. He came in... After a season where we'd finished ninth, now ninth is a particularly, you know, it's a pretty reasonable finish. I'm, I would have been very, very pleased with a ninth finish this season. And the seasons before that, we had finished sixth, sixth, sixth. Had a great run of the Champions League a couple of times, you know, didn't quite make it. We were so close a couple of occasions. I think we were second or third in the league at like January the 1st one year. You know, lost to Chelsea 1-0 very early January after uh, you know Young get the bar a few times. If we'd have got a point there, I thought you know we could have carried on. But unfortunately, we collapsed under O'Neill every season. And you know we were very, very close. So the core of our squad is very, very strong. Only really two key players left in January, uh, left in the summer. Ashley Young, who I admit is a very, very good player. And Stuart Downing, who, like I've said before, has had a miserable season at Liverpool. I think he's got one Premier League assist all season, which is just shocking for £20 million. You know, I would back myself to get more than one assist in a season of Premier League football, especially playing as much as Stuart Downing's had. So, it's just a, a terrible season. So, when you bear in mind that only really two key players have left, and I know lots of players like Nigel Rio Coca and, you know, Steve Sidwell and all those sorts of players left over, you know, the preceding seasons, but these aren't key squad players. So we've only lost two key players. McLeish has spent a decent amount of money as well. Not a lot of people think about this. He spent nine and a half million on Zogbia. He spent four million on Alan Hutton. I mean, Alan Hutton is the worst signing of the season. Actually, no, sorry. Alan Hutton is the second worst signing of the season. The worst signing of the season is Jermaine Jenas because a lot of you guys might not even realise that Jermaine Jenas is technically a Villa player this season because we got him on loan from Spurs. He got injured about three games in and we're still paying his wages now. So he hasn't played for us since August and we are still paying his wages because he's on loan to us. That is how bad a signing it's been from McLeish. So McLeish just had a shocker. It's been Aston Villa's worst season in terms of wins since 1890, 1891. So in 120 years of Aston Villa Football Club, there has not been a worst season than this one. And I know in the 1970s we were in the third division of English football. But let's be quite frank, expectation has gone up a little bit since then. We are a European Cup winning side. We won the European Cup in 1982 and Alex McLeish has done his best to turn us into a championship side. Now the rumour is he's about to get sacked today and if he does get sacked I'm going to be over the moon and I'll be doing backflips down Liverpool High Street all, all week. But. The simple fact of the matter is, even if he goes, it's going to take a long time to sear this season from my memory. There are so, so many bad results. I mean, seven wins, only seven wins. And the results that really stand out massively were the 2-1 defeat at home to the West, uh, to the Baggies, West Bromwich Albion. And they're just a quite simply abysmal, abysmal home draw to Wolves. But you know, the last game of the season as well, away at Norwich. That has to be the worst game of football I've ever watched Aston Villa play. And I've seen some pretty horrendous Aston Villa games over the years. And you know, there's just no fight, no desire, nothing. The, st the, the level of football we play is abysmal. The team selection is atrocious. I mean, we had seven defenders on the field at the weekend. We played three defenders in midfield. How horribly negative is that? I mean, McLeish just has no excuse this season, so... That's why he's in the three shortlist. Now, the third person I'm going to put on the shortlist, I feel a bit sorry for because you know, I intend the worst manager of the year to be a duel out between Kenny Dalglish and Alex, and Alex McLeish because, seriously, I don't think either, any other manager in the Premier League has come close to how badly those two have done. I mean... Some people say Terry Connor, but Terry Connor has been putting in at just an absolutely impossible position at Wolves. He came in when McCarthy should never have been sacked in a million years. 
He was M Mick McCarthy's assistant, so he's got no new ideas. It's not like they've brought an outside guy in to try and freshen it up. They've basically got rid of the experienced guy, given a manager who's had no experience in the Premier League before, just dropped him in at the deep end. So I feel so sorry for Terry Connor. He tried his heart out. I mean, you could see after every loss, he was devastated. He blatantly loves that club. You know, he was devastated every time they didn't win the game. And just on when they got relegated, I felt so sorry for him because he was he was fighting back the tears, you know. And you, you just you can't put a guy like Terry Connor into the worst manager of the year shortlist because you know, he, he was a caretaker. He was just put in at the deep end in impossible circumstances. You know, the owners at Wolverhampton ought to be ashamed of themselves because they have basically destroyed Terry Connor um, and they got rid of McCarthy just totally out of the blue it was just it was really really bad and that's why I'm not going to put him in the list but the guy I'm going to go for to fill up the third place is Steve Keane because Steve Keane um, has just been woeful he is absolutely he's been woeful I mean, there's so much abuse has come off the Blackburn Rovers fans to Steve Keane and that is one thing I really want to you know say the Villa fans that I've seen absolutely detest McLeish but we try and stay supportive of the team as much as possible. When I've watched Blackburn Rovers games, from the first minute to the 90th, the tide of abuse that has come off the stands has been unbelievable. I mean, I think Steve Keane's had a, a virtually impossible job as well. Because he's got the most lunatic bunch of owners in Venkis. They are blatantly asset stripping Blackburn Rovers. I have no idea how they passed the Premier League fit and proper owners test. Because it is just clear that they are selling off players. They are stripping assets. And they are trying to destroy Blackburn. And if I was a Blackburn Rovers fan, I'd be very, very worried about the state of the club now. Because I wouldn't trust Venkis with a pen. Never mind a football club. So hopefully they get sacked off uh, sooner rather than later. And return back to India to do whatever they do out there. Because I don't think they've got any role in um, English football because foreign owners don't bother me at all you know if they come in and show care and care about the football club and show fans respect and show they actually understand football they're more than welcome to come but when you get owners like Venkis and like that Thaksin Shinawatra who came in to take over Man City they are just crooks they are crooks and they should not be allowed to take over a football club so Steve Keane has been put into the list because Blackburn's results have been woeful. They got relegated with a whimper, and that that club is in turmoil at the moment. But like I say, he has had just an absolutely unbelievably hard situation. He has had owners that just are terrible, owners that have left him in the lurch. He has had fans that hate him. I mean, hate him. I was watching the last uh, the game when they got relegated. I think it was I can't even Wigan. It was Wigan Blackburn at Blackburn. I mean. Blackburn had to win this game to have any chance of staying up. If this was any other club in the land, the atmosphere, the fans would be so fired up. They'd be shouting, they'd be screaming their team on, they'd be, I mean, it'd be tension, there'd be tension everywhere. But the fans would be behind the club. But I watched that game and it was a damp squib, literally and metaphorically, because from the first minute to the last, Blackburn's fans did not get behind the team. They slated off the manager non-stop. They slated off the players. They slated off the owners. And I mean, I can understand your frustration. I mean, I'm watching Villa self-destruct in front of my eyes. And it's a club I love. And to see them get completely destroyed by this tactically inept, woeful manager, it's heartbreaking. But at the same time, you've still got to support your team. And, you know, I wanted to put... Steve Keane into this list really just to show how much damage a bad owner can do. I think Steve Keane has you know behaved with tremendous dignity and tremendous self-respect in a, an impossible situation so I'm not going to be too harsh on, the, on Steve Keane. So this is the big decision. Who am I going to give the worst manager of the year to? Kenny Dalglish or Alex McLeish? It was a very very tight run thing but in the end I have to give it to Alex McLeish. You know, Kenny will be the first to admit he hasn't had a particularly good season at Liverpool and his transfers have just been woeful. I mean, I, I'll come back to this again. £16 million for Jordan Henderson. If Jordan Henderson's worth £16 million, I'm worth at least £4 million. So sign me up, Kenny. Sign me up on thirty grand a week. I'd love it. But whatever you say about him, he loves that club. He's moving the club forward. He's, he's trying to move the club forward. He won the Carling Cup, you know. Eighth in the Premier League, it's not a disastrous finish. It's pretty disastrous to have Everton finish above them. But it's not the end of the world. There's something to build on for next season. 
my manager, worst manager of the year, without a shout, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, goes to Alex McLeish. He has tried to systematically destroy Villa, and if he gets sacked today and I never see him again, it will be too soon. He has done his best to destroy my football team, and I want him as far away from Birmingham as possible. Alex McLeish, if you're listening, if you need to lift up to Scotland, I will quite happily give you one. I mean, I will even go out and buy a car especially to give you a lift, so just please, please, I never ever want to hear from you again. Right, I've just gone past the 20 minute mark on my recording, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one more category, then put the rest of the three categories into a part two video, because I want to spend quite a lot of time on these categories, you know, really talking through how I came to my decision, who had a good season, you know, really get into it. So, for the last category, I'm going to do my best player of the year awards. Now, I've gone for three players that you probably would expect to be up there, but I've gone for them for very, very good reasons. And the first player I've decided to put into the list is Robin Van Persie. Now, Robin Van Persie has had quite an exceptional season. 30 Premier League goals, 13 assists, and he has single-handedly almost carried a, a quite poor Arsenal side to third in the table and you cannot overestimate that I mean when you look at the Arsenal team you've got quite a few decent players you know you've got like Chesney in goal very good player Vermaelen centre-half pretty solid player Sanya at right back you know Alex Song in midfield Van Persie up front Wilshire, Ramsey Walcott you know they're all good players but they don't seem to to play very very well together sometimes they have just shocking defensive lapses they're either red hot or stone cold you know they're a team that's so unpredictable so hit and miss and can play so unbelievably one week and so poorly the next week that for them to to finish third really shows how well Robin Van Persie has done this season because the challenge from Spurs this year has been tougher than it's ever been Tottenham for the first I'd say six months of the season played as good a football as Manchester City and Manchester City have played some of the best football in the Premier League era this season so that's a really really high bit of praise for Spurs I think they've had a fantastic season and they have pushed Arsenal all the way and there is no doubt in my mind that if Robin Van Persie wasn't at Arsenal they would have finished below Chelsea in sixth that is how much of an impact Robin Van Persie has on this side now I think if he was to leave Arsenal in the summer, they would be in a lot of trouble. But I personally think he's going to stay. Because we've already heard news that Lucas Podolski is going to sign for Arsenal in the summer. And I think he's a very, very good player. Very good signing. And hopefully, if Arsene Wenger adds a few more players, Van Persie will stay. Because I think it'll be a shame to lose such a great talent from the Premier League. I really think he's an exceptional player. And he's had an exceptional season. So he's the first guy I've decided to put into the list. The second player I've decided to put in is Wayne Rooney. Now, Wayne Rooney equally has had an unbelievable season. You know, he's um, scored 27 league goals, had eight assists in the Premier League, and he makes such a huge difference to Manchester United. You know, I live in a house with two Manchester United fans, so I end up watching quite a lot of their games. So I've noticed that when he's not in the team, United seem half the side. His work rate, his commitment, his quality on the ball. I mean, he's not just a goal scorer anymore. He has a completeness to his game that very few strikers have. He'll drop deep, link the play up. He's a leader. You know, he's beginning to curb his petulance as well because two or three years ago, there was always that nagging doubt in the back of your mind that he was going to turn around and boot someone at any minute. But now, you're very surprised when he gets booked. You know, he, he, he's kept that competitive fight and that desire and he's kept that edge which keeps him, you know, right at the top of the game because Wayne Rooney is as good a player as he is because of that fire inside him. And if you ever got rid of that, you'd, you'd destroy him as a player. You know, you want him to be fired up and angry because he plays three or four times as well when you can tell he's on the edge. You know, he will fight, he will battle, he works, he scores goals, he creates assists. He just builds the play up and he's turning into United's talisman. And, you know, what I like to think about a player when I'm deciding how good they really are is what impact do they have on their team you know someone like Van Song Company for example at Manchester City if you take him out of that side Manchester City become half the team he is a huge leader you know huge presence and that is exactly the same with Wayne Rooney at Manchester United he is an exceptional player and without him United are half the team and he's had a quite outstanding season right up there with Robin Van Persie's 
So it, that's the reason why I've gone for him as my second choice in the three shortlist. Now the third player I've decided to go for was a really tight scrap. I had, you know, I wanted to get a Manchester City player in there because you know, they've had an unbelievable season. They've won the league. But it was so tough. There were three players that I was really fighting it out from Man City to get into this final three shortlist because I wanted to keep it a cross section of the Premier League. You know, I didn't want to just focus too narrowly on one one club or one side. I wanted to give a spread and explain my reasons for it. So what I have done in the end is gone for Joe Hart because, like I was saying earlier, Vincent Company has had an outstanding season. He's had an outstanding season, and personally, in my opinion. If I was picking a World Eleven right now, I would probably go for Vincent Company and Emmanuel Manu Vidic to centre off. That's how highly I rate Company. However, I decided to go for Joe Hart as my Manchester City nomination for Player of the Year because when I look at the, the level of performance Joe Hart has put in over the season, he has been absolutely flawless from Game 1 to Game 38. I mean, he hasn't had a bad spell. He's been consistent. He's pulled off huge saves at vital times I mean set that save against Wigan for example to give them you know that ensure the three points against Wigan these are massive saves and if you took Joe Hart out of Manchester City they wouldn't have won the league this season you know there's quite a few players you can say that with you can say that to, about Yaya Toure and Sergio Aguero and Vincent Kompany but I think Joe Hart has the single biggest impact on a team of anyone in the Premier League and you know I even think he has a bigger impact than Van Persie at Arsenal because Joe Hart in my opinion is the best keeper in the Premier League now he's just so composed he's such a great shot stopper he can distribute he's a calming influence as well because Man City always seem a little bit nervous when they don't have the chill raise the companies and the hearts in the team so having that calming influence at the back, having such an assured st shot stopper as well, it just gives the defence so much confidence. And you can see it, I mean, with company, Lescott, Richards, you know, Clichy and Hart, that is a fantastic back four. I mean, even when you start to bring players like Zabaleta in, Zabaleta, another fantastic player, you know, lots of permutations at the back but the one person for me who is always first name on that team sheet for Man City is Joe Hart and he has had an exceptional season and that is why he's in the shortlist so I've explained to you why I've picked my three players for the shortlist it's been a very very tough decision really there were there were six or seven players in contention for player of the season in my opinion you know I've mentioned a couple of them already but you know they've had absolutely outstanding seasons all three of them I think they are the three standout players of the season you know if Papi Cisse had given uh, had played from the start of the season I would have given him a shout but obviously he just came in January and Demba Barr was up there but he's dropped off in the second half of the season sort of as Cisse's come in because I quite I think Demba Barr quite enjoys being that that talisman of the front line now he's got someone equally as talented alongside him possibly even more talented I think it's knocked him off his stride a little bit. So that's why Denver Bar didn't quite make it. But in the end, I've decided to go for Joe Hart as best player of the year. I mean, it was so close. And I, it's like, it's a photo finish between these three. It really is so close. But Manchester City winning the league and with Joe Hart playing such a massive part in it because, you know, Vincent Company was injured quite a, quite a substantial part of the season. You know, a month, two months, somewhere around there. And Joe Hart managed to limit the damage so much because Man City really did drop off when they missed com when company was missing but imagine how bad it would have been if Joe Hart was missing you know he got them points which in the end managed to win them the Premier League title without Joe Hart Man City would have lost so that is the reason why I've given Joe Hart my best player of the year. So, guys, I really hope you've enjoyed part one of my Barclays Premier League season review. It went on for a lot longer than I was expecting. I'm, I'm approaching 29 minutes now, and I've still got three more categories to go. So, it'd be very, very interesting for another video. I'll probably do that tomorrow or Wednesday. But, guys, once again, I really hope you've enjoyed watching part one of my Barclays Premier League review for the 2011-2012 season. And I really hope you're looking forward to part two. So, guys, once again, thank you so, so much for watching, and have a fantastic day.